Okay, we're going to change the... Yeah. Aha. All right, did everyone fill out their form? Yes. Excellent. We're going to start by, I would like um, some of those of you in the room to share a curiosity that you learned about someone else. Okay, so hopefully you did talk to some other people and share your curiosities, but could someone share with me something you learned about somebody else in the room? I will see how well you follow directions. Yes? Um, my baby friend is very curious about mythology. Mythology, fantastic. Mythology, yeah, so that's nice and meaty. Another? Yes? Bill likes rocket ships. Bill, where is Bill? Bill, excellent, rocket ships, so super cool. More? Don't leave me call on you. Matthew, draw, draw, draw. Draw, draw, draw. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. You know, uh, was that five to twelve, or did it fall into both? It was five to twelve, and then I started making, making, making. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Another one. Yes. Is that there was very interested in history at six years old. Six years old in history. Yum. Yeah. Captain. Traveling. Traveling. So, when, what age did that begin to emerge? Um, between five and twelve, because her family moved from Argentina. <sighs> so it's, it, it became a bug, something of interest, really early on. Fantastic. Another one. One more. Yes. And her uh, obsession, keen obsession with British obscure rock bands. British obscure rock bands. That was a fun conversation. I got in on that one too. Thank you. Excellent. This is um, this was important because I last week started asking my colleagues at the museum. Hey guys, it started with one person. What were you deeply curious about? You know, between the ages of five and 12. And I remember the first person I asked, they were like, well, let me think about it. And, and the next thing I knew, not only was she in my office, like seven other people were in my office. And we were having conversations about ant hills, boxcar children. Um, I remember her saying, now don't get me wrong, it wasn't that I was obsessed with hobos, but I was really fascinated by the hobo culture. And, and then, you know, I had um, other um, colleagues that were, were actually sharing with me how they convinced others of the, the, um, that vampires truly do exist. And they had created almost like a cult in high school around believing in this existence of vampires and fairies. And, and the more they talked, the more excited they got. We, we had um, one of my colleagues was acting out her Xeno warrior princess um, you know, uh, moves with the bar that they used and everything. And I realized there's something kind of magical about our childhood curiosities. So that was the start of um, my thinking about today, is those things in which we, we became deeply curious about as children. And then I began to ask the question, are these curiosities the secret to a passionate and creative life? Is this what it's all about? Because the more they talked, the more I saw them turn on, right? So what is it about curiosity? Here's my definition. Now, it may not match um, Webster's, but this is what I think about when I think about curiosity. It's the insatiable desire to explore, know about, or understand something. And insatiable is the word that I want you to stick with. Like, it, you can't almost control yourself. You're so um, engaged with whatever that thing might be. This all started for me thinking about curiosity. 
as, um, as I work at the Columbus Museum of Art, and we began to work on a center for um, creativity. Uh, as I've been researching creativity, sadly, my findings are not optimistic or positive. This was a report that came out the year before we opened the Center for Creativity, which more or less summarizes and says that in the United States, something extraordinary has happened for decades. And that is that um, the uh, IQ tests in the US and the Torrance creativity tests every 10 years bump up about 10 points. So for decade after decade after decade, we've seen these incredible increases in IQ in the United States and our creativity scores. Until the 1990s, IQ continues to increase, and this is in particular with ages six to 12. Creativity in this country though, starting in the 1990s, begins to plot. Anybody wanna throw out, what do you think those reasons, and this report has lots of reasons, but any ideas what some of those reasons might be? Overly structured activities for kids. Absolutely, that we are moving to really, really structured activities um, they, that are facilitated by adults, not by, by children. Other thoughts? Technology and entertainment. Technology and entertainment. We are a screen, I mean, and it's getting worse and worse. There is, of course, a lot of creativity in technology but most of it is very passive. So, you know, screens. Yes? Think about the 1990s. No child left behind, and it begins, right? High tests, um, high stake testing. You get the gist. What we realized is that creativity in this um, society is at a crossroads. We are um, at a point where we no longer are the leader around creative thinking. This was a, a report that um, completely ripped my, um, my heart out. Um, Susan Engel is, uh, had gotten uh, an incredible amount of money to do a, a research study for three months looking at kindergarten and fifth grade students. Um, it was in a well-funded school, so there were all the supports there. And if you do research, you know there are a lot of obstacles to getting your research done. Her focus was to find where is curiosity in learning. So she focused on these two particular grades. And um, the study was canceled. Here's what she said. It turned out to be impossible because there was such a, an astonishing low rate of curiosity in any of the classrooms we visited. Now that just doesn't rip your heart out like it does me, then there's something wrong with you because clearly it, this, is, this is a crisis. Where is curiosity? Curiosity is the thing that everybody got excited about this morning, talking about their childhood curiosities, and yet it was missing from learning. Here's another rationale around why we've got to be serious about creativity and curiosity. Because what I can tell you, and Dave was alluding to this, I feel that curiosity is the ignition, it's the gasoline for creativity. Creativity is the ability um, to use your imagination and critical thinking skills to develop new ideas that have value. But that doesn't happen just by saying, Today, I'm going to be creative. It happens when there's an ignition, and curiosity is the ultimate um, gasoline on that, that fire. So if we need creativity, and what they're saying here, this is a future of jobs report. And in 2015, they made a list of all the things we need as far as skills in society today. And of course, when this came out, I was thrilled to see creativity was on the list. It was number 10. But as of um, the last report that was just um, put out, in 2020, what they are saying is now creativity has moved to number three. Complex problem solving is number one. Critical thinking is number two. These are the, the skills we need most, and yet it's plummeting in our society, and curiosity, the ignition, it's 
almost impossible to find in classrooms. So here's what I believe. I believe that the thorny problems of our time, whether they are innovation problems, whether they are social justice problems, whether they are human interaction problems, can only be solved by new ideas, creative new ideas that have value. And so we must focus on how are we going to get there? How are we going to create these new ideas? There's an incredible thinker who um, gave me uh, kind of a, a new framework around this. His name is Warren Berger. And if you, if you get into this kind of uh, work, check out his book, um, um, More Beautiful Question. He believes that the future of learning is not about content which is what we focus on now, that the future of learning will be the development of beautiful questions. And when we had him to the museum for a creativity summit, he had been thinking about the work we were doing, and he came up with the wondrous circle. And what he said is the, wonder, the wondrous circle is actually what happens before creativity. It's kind of this catalyst. It starts with wonder, which is a state, that we're in, it moves to curiosity, which is a condition, and then it leads to questioning, which is action. So let me give you a little bit more of a sense of what I'm talking about here. Let's start with wonder. Wonder is suspended disbelief. It's that moment where a child sees their shadow and they don't know what they're seeing, but they're, new, they're open to new ideas and new understandings. It's when they see something and it captures them and they're enthralled by it, but they don't understand what that's all about. Wonder is, can be, um, the, it can be something that's abject, that's sublime, that's awe-inspiring. It, it can manifest in a number of ways, but it's what brings us in if we're open to wonder. Let me show you, and go down and hit the little video button at the bottom of this. See if it comes. Yeah, click on the green and see if, it, if, if we get any magic. Ah, uh, there we go. So, wonder is the moment where you see something and, and, and a, a crazy sound happens in the background and you're like, the world is ending! Um, so wonder is that space of kind of, what am I experiencing, right? But immediately wonder is followed by curiosity. Like, I saw, maybe hit it again, Anne-Marie. I saw this thing, I'm totally enthralled by it. And then immediately, curiosity begins to take, take over. What I don't have on this video is what happened next, because I think I was too taken with the moment, which was the rapid fire questions. And they just came like a hundred, what's happening? Where's the water coming from? Why is this, why is it on top of the water? Where, what, you know, I wonder if I can dig into it. And you could just hear all of the questions. And that all happened in a matter of seconds. Wonder, curiosity, questioning. And that's why I love this video because it kind of captured for me how that happens. Sometimes it's a longer period. This was just that moment. The questioning part of this circle is really, really fascinating because I think it, um, we, we understand the importance of questioning, but this is what Warren Berger said. Questioning is the ability to organize our thinking around what we don't know. What we don't know. So it's the ability to just synthesize and organize what we don't know and begin to move on that, act on it. So now that you've got the sense of the wonder circle, what feeds this wonder circle? And I have two, um, two beliefs here. I think there, in order to feed our curiosity, two things need to be in, in active. One, curiosity breeding, and two, expert eradication. I will explain. So first, ah. Uh, this was my curiosity breeder. 
I grew up in Southern Ohio. Let me just see if there's any other Appalachian um, folks in the room, or am I the only? Yes, thank you. Um, we will connect after the, the, the show. But I grew up in Southern Ohio. Um, Chesapeake, Ohio is near Huntington, West Virginia, and Ashland, Kentucky. I wasn't exposed to a lot as a kid as far as culture. The last thing you would have imagined is that I would have ended up in, in a contemporary art world or even in an art museum. But um, this is my grandfather. And my grandfather, Albert, um, had been a, worked in a factory and had been an expert pipe fitter. He was a skilled laborer. But in high school, he had found a passion for drawing and even contributed some things to his, his high school yearbook and made a couple paintings. Then his life with four kids and a, a very, um, uh, you know, he had cows and a farm and um, uh, uh, work. He, he put a lot of his curiosities kind of under the table, but they kept brewing. This was a man who was deeply, deeply curious. And the thing he was curious about was nature and art. So at a certain point, about three years before he retired, he decided to bring his art back out. And he self-taught him, he, he was a self, he became a self-taught painter. Now this is a, a great image of my cousin Kathy sitting in her high chair watching him paint. And we all remember, 12 grandkids, we all remember going into the house and immediately there was a, a stairs down to the basement. And he had set up this tiny studio down there. And he was constantly working and we loved to gather around him and watch him work. And he had all these crazy clippings of these marvelous places. For example, this is where he was interviewed by the Belpre um, newspaper. And he had created a, an amazing painting of this castle because he'd seen in the newspaper, because someone in Parkersburg, West Virginia had bought the castle and um, they were gonna be turning it into a hotel and he was fascinated, it was just in black and white. He wanted to think about what it would look like in color. So he painted that, that um, castle. He was so deeply curious. Here's the crazy thing about my grandfather. He um, just exuded this curiosity all the time. To the point now I realize those 12 grandkids, seven of us are in the arts. Two of them are architects, designers. I'm in museums, um, you know, builders. Now, the other ones are also in creative fields, except for the one that's in politics, and that's my sister. But, um, <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's, if you think about the impact of a curiosity breeder, someone who's deeply curious, you realize what they do to our psyche and how they turn us on to new ideas and, and experiences that were outside of our realm. So to continue with my story a little bit, in 1988, um, I remember being in art class. Does anyone else remember art and man? You, it was like, that, uh, like a little magazine that was distributed in art classes. And I remember this issue. I was a 11th grader, and I was fascinated. Who is this Warhol? I think he'd recently died, and so they, you know, in his death, they decided, well, let's put him up on the cover, and we'll do a little, um, what's pop art all about? So I'm learning about pop art. And then something else happens. That summer, my parents had taken us to um, uh, Minneapolis, and we'd gone to the Walker Art Center. And with my disposable camera, click, light bulb goes off. I realize I'm standing in front of a Warhol. This is the photo I took of that Warhol at the Walker Art Center. That's where it all changed, right? Like all that time, my grandfather had been planting this curiosity seed and now it was up to me. My curiosity began. I ended up going back to school and in your senior year you have to do a thesis and my thesis was gonna be on Warhol. My parents asked me, after I'd done that thesis, Cindy, would you like to go with your high school class on the senior field trip, or we'll take you somewhere, we'll go on a family trip? And I said, I do this, by the way, I get emotional. Um, gotta do it at least once, get it out of the way. So, but I said, no, we're gonna go to Chicago, where they were having the first retrospective of his work. 
Now you get, why am I in museums? It goes back, right? Those seeds are planted, and we can't help ourselves. Now, I will say that curiosity, there are three ways curiosity um, breeders kind of evolve in our lives. One of them is that you can be deeply curious and people are influenced by you. The other way is my mom saw that I was curious and she kept feeding my curiosity by letting me go to museums and seeing these things. This was a normal part of our lives. The third way is when you're self, um, you, you begin self-feeding. So I started picking up books. Everything changed. Have any of you read the Andy Warhol Diaries? Oh my, so beginning college, I'm reading the Warhol Diaries. Let's just say, at this point, it's no longer about art. <laughs> it is about uh, deviance and decadence, and I, I mean, it changed so much for me. I was exposed to things I never imagined, and I loved it. So the way in which curiosity begins to foster and blend is kind of a, uh, an amazing thing. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, this idea of uh, extinguishing expertise. Now, those of you who are experts in the room, we are not going to have a firing squad or anything at the end of this where you, um, we're, I'm, not, I'm not saying that there's necessarily something bad about the expert. What I am um, alluding to is some research I read that said there are two people, the two types of people that grow um, their creativity less slowly. One are those that are really comfortable in ignorance. They're comfortable in not expanding what they don't know. The other group are experts, because experts are trying to hold on to the expertise they've brought forward. So when I think about that, I think about how important it is to extinguish or push down our sense of expert around something. I give you Evan Penny, he's an artist at the museum. He's a perfect example of someone who was an expert. He was in the Hollywood movie making business, he was making these incredible models, and he felt really constrained by that. It had ended up just being a job. He was the expert, but it no longer had held that space of curiosity for him. So he decided to become an artist. And what he did is he began borrowing from other fields. And this idea of transdisciplinary research really emerged for him. And transdisciplinary research is where, as someone who's curious, you realize Maybe it's outside your level of uh, your field, your comfort, um, the area that you know best, that you're going to find the thing you seek. So in his case, he went to mathematics and realized that if he manipulated some of the equations, he could create these um, incredible sculptures that would be mind-blowing even though he didn't know exactly what would happen as he was making them. And he talked about the tame in the wild, how he wanted to be in that space where he was scared of that it could fail, but he knew that that's where it, the magic would happen. So to give you another scenario around squashing expertise, this is my son Emmett. Emmett is 13, um, and he's at that stage where he... I mean, he has interests, but a lot of those interests are pretty, you know, benign right now. Um, and, and I'm not trying to, I'm just saying 13-year-olds, you know, they, they, okay, we'll talk about 13-year-olds later. <laughs> but there was a point this summer where he was down at the museum, and he kept talking to me about the buildings downtown. And he, I realized he was fascinated with the city and the structure of cities. So when I was doing a teaching gig in Massachusetts, I decided to take him along. And he became obsessed, deeply curious about public transportation. Now, I either could have seen this as like, okay, a fleeting thing, or I could be a curiosity breeder. So what I did, and see if you can hit that video on, on the other one, and, and just to give you a sense of how, how much joy the subway brought him. Yeah, let's see. He'll kill me when he realizes I... <laughs> My God, 
constantly smiling, loved public transportation. So what I did is I had to take a risk. I had to, my expertise was as a mom, I need to control his life. I gave him a subway card. I gave him some parameters and I said, go explore. He took a camera and he began to just find out. And what I love about, um, I had to squash my expertise as a parent. Later that night, we had dinner with some people from Boston and he began asking questions about why are these double-decker bike um, facilities outside of each of the subway um, stations? Why do, do certain people get on at certain stations and certain people get on at other stations? People look different at each of the stations. He was making all these incredible observations. And the people at the table were blown away by that. And these were experts of Boston, right? So again, how do we squash the things that we think we know in order to open up a whole new um, realm of understanding? So in the spirit of not knowing, um, I'm going to be giving you some creative morning curiosity challenges. The first thing I need you to do, and I need my friends to maybe help me out, just like when you're at church and you have to uh, put into the, uh, the um, um, donation basket, I'm going to have everyone take your yellow sticky notes off of the sheet and pass them to the end of the rows where they will be collected. So take them off and send them down to the end. And while you're doing that, <clears throat> okay. Between now and the next time we gather, I'm going to give you three challenges. Challenge number one, <clears throat> engage in not knowing. Engage in not knowing. Go someplace where you're not an expert. My first suggestion might be a, um, what I like to call curiosity factories, museums. I have friends here from the High History Center. I know there are probably some folks from COSI, the Columbus Museum of Art. Go somewhere where you're going to encounter something you don't know anything about. And, and try to give yourself the space and time to fall into wonder, fascination and wonder, and, and go through that cycle, the wondrous cycle, wonder, curiosity, and then question. Now, if you happen to work in a museum, it doesn't work for us. We're all in, or if you're really comfortable in museums, where's the place that you need to go that will push you into a space of somewhat discomfort but deep curiosity? Sandra, I think I saw her earlier, is one of the best models. She's our speaker next month. Is, there she is. Um, Every time I sit with her, she tells me about a place that she's been, a group that she's met with. She'll probably talk a lot about that next time. But she's always giving me a little list that I keep in a notebook. Now, I haven't made it to many of those, but they're in a list and I'm going to. But find a person, your curiosity breeder, who's that person that pokes you to try something that you know, once you get there, it will just breed more curiosity. Your second challenge, intentionally breed curiosity. Share your wonderings, your fascinations, your ahas with others. Sometimes we're a little embarrassed. I mean, who honestly had something pretty ridiculous on one of those sticky notes? Yep, yep. I mean, sometimes our, our curiosities are quite odd, but wonderful, right? But we need to share them because what we know about creativity, and there's a, a great study by uh, Robert Root Bernstein. He is a researcher out of the University of Michigan. And what he did is he looked at Nobel Science laureates, and he realized 
that more Nobel Science laureates actually have arts-related curiosities. They have something completely outside, or what's perceived to be outside, of their expertise that feeds their curiosity. Some of them um, pick up local theater. Some of them um, have picked up painting or some sort of art making, music. But they, they feed their curiosity with something outside their field. And that's what we need sometimes, is to find what are those things that will feed our curiosity. And they may be something you don't even know that exists yet. So share yours with others in order to surface new ones as well. Here's the challenge. How many of you are parents? Yeah. This is the other piece of this. How do we encourage other people's curiosities even when we do not dig what they're curious about? <laughs> Back to that seventh grader, I can, I can feed him um, city kind of experiences all the time, but what he's really obsessed with right now is Cleveland Cavaliers and basketball. I, I don't even know how to say Cavaliers properly. <laughs> so, but how do we get in a space of being comfortable with feeding curiosities um, even when they're not something we personally did. And your third challenge, self-propagate some new curiosities. As you leave today, we have made piles of all these wonderful things that people were curious about when they were children, when they were experts in curiosity. Your task is you will receive one of these sticky notes as you leave. And before you come back next time, if you get Orca Wells, do not come in this room or the, wherever we're hosting it next time without have researched or un investigated Orca Wales. It is your responsibility to seek out something awesome. And that was David Butler's, by the way. That was his obsession between 5 and 12. So investigate something you wouldn't otherwise. <clears throat> That's all I have for today. Dave, maybe we um, have some conversation, but thank you all.